Amen. Please grab a seat and welcome Josh to the stage with our sermon this morning. Amen. I'm going to fix this a little bit. Good morning. Just glad to get to, to be together this morning. Uh, good to be here. Glad I made it on time. Right? Uh, didn't I'm not still asleep. Somebody pinch me. I'm st- okay, I'm here. Uh, so, we're just going to dive right in. I'm excited, and all of the, the worship this morning has kind of been leading into the topic uh, that we're really going to dive into here. Uh, of course, we just finished uh, a series going through the book of Acts. Uh, hopefully, I can get, there we go. Uh, even Greater Things, of course, is our theme uh, for the year, right? Uh, this, this idea that we looked at uh, this scripture, which I'll actually turn to right now, in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. That's pretty incredible. What a promise, right? That, that Jesus said, we, whoever believes in him, will do the works he's been doing, amen, we should imitate Jesus, and we'll do even greater things than these. What a promise. Something to to put our hope in, to hope for, right? To be excited about. And we've been diving in through the book of Acts, right? If if you haven't been here, uh, it was an awesome series. uh, And Tim just concluded it last week, uh, really closing out the book of Acts. And we looked at it in kind of six sections uh, as you know, the original author, Luke, really kind of meant for those to be the chapters in a way, right? Now, the chapters that are in there are great. We can find verses, things like that. But he kind of broke it up into those sections. And that's kind of what we talked through. And we really dove into what did it look like in the first century for Christians to live out this promise, to truly embody what it is that Jesus was calling them to live out in this very verse, right? That they would go on to do even greater things. They set the example for us to truly do the same today, that we can do even greater things because we believe and we try and work to imitate how Christ lived. And so we're actually going to start a new series, uh, which is kind of a continuation of the same series, and the title is Even Greater. Even Greater dot dot dot, even greater blank right? Fill in the blank in a way, right? So we are going to dive into these notions of what things ought we to do, to go after, to be, that we can embody this even greater mentality. We fill in the blank there uh, with a new topic each week, something that, that we ought to do to be even greater, something that we ought to be to be even greater, to do even greater things than Jesus had done up to that point. That's pretty incredible, right? And so that's what what the series we're going to kick off here is. But I'm so glad we're getting to start with the topic we have today. Because all of the things that we do, all of the things that we can aspire to, to be greater in, we can only be greater in because we have a greater God. An even greater God, right? Our God truly is greater, even greater than all of the other things that can be in our lives. And we only have the opportunity to live out all the more the promise that Jesus offered in that last scripture we looked at because our God is so great. He is carrying the team, all right? When we do even greater things because Jesus said we would, it's not because we're awesome. It's because God's awesome, right? Because he is even greater. Greater. So the title for our sermon this morning to kick off our even greater series is Even Greater God. Now this is not the notion that God himself is becoming greater somehow because we're doing something. It's not about that at all. It's this notion, this idea that God is even greater. Oh man, this thing that's in my life, well, God's even greater. Right? All these different things and all these different things we want to try and live out, it's only because God is even greater. And so I want to take a moment this morning to really dive in and think about how great is our God? How truly great 
is he? And the answer is, he's even greater. <laughs> so let's dive in uh, to this notion. So in that scripture that we looked at, I'll turn back to it for a, for a moment. This word here uh, that, that's used, even greater, this word greater is all over the New Testament. In fact, it in one form or another happens around 250 times across the New Testament. That's a lot of times, right? Uh, that's like 10 per book. <laughs> so this word is all over the place uh, in, in this New Testament. And, you know, a different version of the word, the Hebrew word, uh, is all over the Old Testament. And so this notion of things being greater, of things being great, is everywhere. It's painted all over all of these passages. And it's, in fact, all over the book of Acts. We see tons of different examples. And, and even thinking of a few, uh, this word both translates to great and loud, right? Loud. Uh, and so if somebody cried out in a loud voice, like when uh, the women came and found the empty tomb, they started proclaiming in a loud voice, in a great voice, to those uh, that, that Jesus was gone, right? And so we see it in all different places, but what's interesting is as great as our God is, it's only like a handful of times, maybe four or five, that we see this word great applied to God himself. Isn't that intriguing? Well, I thought you said our God is even greater. <laughs> well, he is. We'll, we'll get there. Amen? Uh, there's just a few, in fact, maybe a couple that even have much of a significance to what they're even discussing in the passage. Most of the time it's like, Oh yeah, let's keep in mind our great God. It's just this kind of like passing word, which has a lot of meaning, amen, but doesn't really add too much to the understanding of the passage itself. So we're going to dive into one particular place. Uh, so turn with me to John chapter 10, and we're going to look at one of the times Jesus refers to our God as being greater. And hopefully this will understand, I say hopefully, I already know, right? Well, spoiler alert, it's going to show us, right? Uh, it will dive into why exactly we see this word applied to God so infrequently. So starting in verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they know, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my father's hand or out of my hand. I'm sorry. My father, who's given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. Did you catch that word greater in there? Right? That Jesus applied to, to God. And what does he say? He's greater than all. Now, first and foremost, let's uh, look at the very beginning here. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. Do you know God? Do you know his voice? Are you a member of his sheep? Are you one of his sheep? That's something all of us need to make sure we understand. As this passage is trying to get us to, to have this belief in, in a greater God, amen? And that that should yield confidence. If we truly are his sheep, we can be confident in him. Because if you're his, he's got you. There's nothing that can take you out of his hand. Right? God's going to love you no matter what. As long as you truly belong to him, and the only one who can make that choice whether or not you belong to him is you. You can choose to no longer belong. You can choose to decide, I'm going to belong to him. That choice is yours. No one else is great enough to take you out of God's hand. And here we get to the, the answer we've been searching for, right? This understanding that God is greater than all. There's nothing that is greater than our great God. And this is why this word great is used so infrequently to describe our God, because it, it kind of doesn't really match up to describing him, right? All these other things can be great, there's, there's great persecution in the book of Acts. They did great works. They did great things, right? And yet, it all kind of pales in comparison to our great God. Because he's just greater than all. He's greater than all that. And so, 
What the Bible does, rather than just say, oh, God's great, which it does every now and then, very infrequently though, what it more likes to do is explain something else that's great and then show how God is greater. Make it evident, not by, you know, oh, just trust the words here, which, amen, we should trust the words that are in the Bible, but the Bible shows, it doesn't just tell. And so it paints a picture for us of, you know, this thing that's really great? Yeah, that's nothing compared to God. That's awesome. And we're going to dive into just such a story as that, where we're going to look at something that truly is great, and we'll see, well, is God greater? Yes, he is. That's the, that's the spoiler there, right? That God is truly greater. So turn with me to Mark chapter 4. This is where we're going to be for the remainder of our morning. Mark chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 35. And this story truly exemplifies this. And we, in fact, see this very word, great, used twice. And I'll point them out when we show them because they've been translated slightly differently. So picking up in verse 35. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, that's Jesus, of course, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall, that word furious is that word great. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And we'll keep reading in a little bit. This is the setting for our story. And what we see here is a great tempest come on the water. But let's first consider what was going on before that. Jesus had a long day of teaching. In fact, I I believe right before this, he was on a boat because the crowd was so big so he could teach all of them. So he kind of went out not deep, but a little bit into the water. And they took him as he was into this boat. Maybe it was the very same boat. I don't know, right? And so what we see here is an exhausted Jesus. And he goes below deck to sleep in the stern, right? I think this this is just a freebie, all right? Uh, Just a little aside. So often we think of being tired, being exhausted as a bad thing. As if we had done something wrong. As if we overexerted ourselves. Well, I'll never do that again. Jesus exerted himself quite heavily here. To the point that he was asleep during a, a, a great tempest. Right? I mean, you try that. See how that goes, right? <laughs> it's, I'm sure it's difficult. I've never tried. So, uh, But, man, this is how tired Jesus was. And, yes, rest is great, too. And Jesus was getting that, amen? But it should never stop us from pushing ourselves and doing things that are tough. That was just a freebie. Our God's great, but, uh, you know, that's in here. So uh, (laughs) he says, let's go over to the other side. They leave the crowd behind, and he's resting as this great tempest starts to build and build and build. Maybe it comes all of a sudden upon them, and the waves start crashing over the boat itself. This is a great tempest. Have you ever seen one of those in your life? Or perhaps a figurative tempest, a great storm in your life. Uh, Something just intense that comes upon your life and really shakes things up. In a way that you didn't expect or don't know how to do anything about or don't have any control over. Life does this time and time and time and time again, right? It all too often takes us for for just this incredible ride, tossing us to and fro with difficulty after difficulty, stacking up time and time again. And don't get me wrong, sometimes we mount some of those difficulties on ourselves, don't we? And yet, there's still storms, there's still tempests. And we deal with things sometimes of our own volition and fault, and sometimes completely out of our control, nothing we did uh, to cause it. But all the same, we experience great tempests time and time again, difficulties upon difficulties in our lives. Any of us ever been there? Where we have thing after thing after thing come upon us, uh, and it feels like we're just taking on water. 
that we're overwhelmed. I don't have room. My boat's not big enough to handle this. I can't do this, is all too often how we feel. Life has a way of truly getting out of control just all of a sudden, (laughs) really out of nowhere. And sometimes it comes just from our basic responsibilities, right? Like just upkeep of wherever it is we live. Uh, Maybe it's your job, your chores, your family, uh, and, and things like that blessings, all of them, and yet they can be storms at times. They can make things hard. They can be overwhelming. In my life, I've got another storm on the horizon. Uh, what, what, so I imagine, you know, I'm excited for Parker to be here, uh, our son, uh, for those who don't know. Uh, and, you know, if Katie or Crystal or somebody gives me the, you know, the, the motion, somebody's finishing the sermon for me because I'm out, all right? Uh, <laughs> Right, But I don't know when this, this storm is going to hit in a way, but I know it's coming. Uh, and, and it's even preparing for having a baby has been a bit of its own tempest, if you will. Uh, some difficulty, and we've been diving in trying to get all this advice from many of you guys in this room and many people out of this room, and, and it's just so much. And it's so impossible for me to even know what's it going to be like. And everybody keeps reminding me of that. Just you wait until this. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I don't, I don't get it yet, okay? I get that I don't get it. But it, it's just a tempest, right? And, and there's nothing wrong with Parker. I'm excited for him. He didn't do anything wrong. But it's going to be a life change. And life changes are hard. They're difficult. They're tough. And we go up against these changes and these tempests and so often feel overwhelmed. What are the storms in your life? What have been the greatest storms of your life? The most difficult things to to move past, to get through. The trials that have been particularly challenging. The life changes that are particularly overwhelming. Think about those times that you have had. Think about times you will have that are like that. The storms of life truly can be great. And when those storms, when those tempests are right in front of us, when we are in the thick of them, it is so difficult to imagine that something can be greater. Even our God. When we're up against those difficult storms, it's hard to imagine something can be greater. And yet, that's just what we'll see. That God is greater. And I think something that's important to note is a third of these disciples on this boat were fishermen. They were out on the waters day in, day out, right? Until they were asked by Jesus to follow him, this was their life. And so you'd think these guys would be the most equipped in a storm like this, and yet they are kind of freaking out, right? And they come uh, before Jesus, as we'll read in here in a moment, Uh, because they're scared. They're frightened. That's how intense this storm is. Or maybe they'd heard tales from their their parents, their father, uh, who continued to take them out, and he'd look and say, no, we're not going out tonight, because there's a storm. And he would tell them about this storm that he barely survived, or that there, you know, anything that could have happened in in his life, or in their lives, or whoever shared. And they're just imagining, this is it. This is the storm I was warned about, right? And they're freaking out, and they go before Jesus. Let's read that, shall we? Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down, and it was completely Calm. And we see our second use of this word great translated as completely. This calm was great. Now that's interesting. Let's begin at the, at the start here. How did the disciples respond? Teacher, don't you care? When we're in the midst of our difficult times, how often do we say or think the same thing? God, don't you care? Don't you care about me? 
Don't you care about what I'm going through? Don't you empathize with me? How could you let me go through something like this, something so difficult, so hard, so trying? I don't like it. How dare you do something like this to me? Don't you care? So often we question God, perhaps even question his greatness, right? Are you even capable of doing anything? Can God even help? Or maybe we just question the greatness of his compassion. How much does he actually care? If he's, he's making me go through this, how much does he really care? So often we say things like this, inflammatory things where we blame God. Now, sometimes he does bring storms into our lives. Sometimes we bring them in ourselves, amen? And sometimes it's neither. It's just things that happen that God can use to do great things. But I think what's important to note is where was Jesus this whole time? He hadn't, you know, removed himself from the storm, from the boat. He was there the whole time. Jesus was always with them in the storm. As you go through your tempests, your storms in life, God is always with you. And so often we come and and accuse him, much like this, don't you care? And God's like, I've been here the whole time. Of course I care. I've been experiencing it with you. I've been carrying you along through it. You should have seen the storm if I wasn't here. This is the reality. God is with us in the storms. God is with you in the trials, in the difficulties, in the hardships, even the ones you cause. God is still all so often with you. He loves you. He has this compassion for you. He's going through it with you. So the question is, who do you go to in the tempest? Now, I'm dogging on these disciples a little bit, even though this can be us too. Amen. I'm not speaking down to them. And it's obvious to me that their response here in how they talk to Jesus is a little bit, you know, iffy. (laughs) Probably they're coming in with an attitude of accusation. And that's not fair to God and improper. And yet, one thing I do want to build them up for is they went to Jesus. In the tempest, they were smart enough. I don't know if it's their first thing they did or their last or their middle. I don't know. But they were smart enough to know Jesus is the one I need to go to. Jesus is the one who can do something. Who do you go to in the tempest? As we see Jesus answer them, (laughs) I imagine he is a little cranky. I don't know about you, right? I mean, he's, he's beat. He's tired. He's exhausted. He's like, I was just, I was just trying to get some rest, you know? Uh, I felt like that a few mornings when Katie's like, hey, can you do this thing for me? And I'm like, oh, she's pregnant, so I should. But I really want to sleep, right? And I feel a little bit of like, no, I can't treat her like that. Uh, and I've been mostly good, I think. She can tell you if, if I haven't been. But I feel this a little bit. I feel like when I just wake up is a totally different Josh than when I'm awake now. You know what I mean? Like I act different. I'm a different human. So it doesn't count, I think. Is that true? No, it's not true. But (laughs) we need to be disciples all the time. Amen? (laughs) But I imagine Jesus is a little cranky. And yet he comes up and he calms the storm. What an incredible sight that would have been. To watch Jesus come above deck and rebuke the wind and shout to the, to the waves, and they listen. Wow. Gives me chills just imagining that. This great tempest was nothing compared to our great God. It was nothing. God was so capable of dealing with it that it just took a moment of Jesus saying, quiet down, and the storm was gone. This is how great our God is. I mean, this is just a a fragment, to be honest, of how great our God is, right? That on on a whim, on a thought, this storm can be reduced to nothing, to great calm. 
It's this calm that's made all the more great by the intensity of the tempest that was just raging a moment before. And now, nothing. He can calm even the greatest storm in only a moment. Now, this is not some prosperity gospel where if you're faithful enough, God will calm all your storms whenever you want. That's not what I'm talking about here. And I don't think that's the takeaway from this story. But what we do see here is that God can calm any storm. It doesn't matter how great the tempest is. Our God is greater. And if he wills it, if it's appropriate, if it's time, he will calm that storm if it's needed. However, what this also means for us is we can logic and reason this out a little bit, okay? We know, one, he is capable of calming any storm. Any tempest that may be raging in your life, God can calm it. We also know, number two, God cares immensely. His compassion for you is unconditional and boundless, abundant. God loves you to a depth that you frankly can't understand. With those two understandings, we can gather and reason together that any storm that you are going through, God is in control of. And if it's still raging, then that means he must believe in you, that you can handle it and handle it in a godly way. Not just get through it however it takes. You know, I I have to do what I have to do, so I'm not going to be godly now. No, God wouldn't do that to you. He cares for you so immensely, so deeply, and he is in such great control of whatever situations we come across here that he has you there for something. I don't know if it's to bring glory to him in in that particular instance, for you to grow closer to him, for you to inspire someone else to grow closer to him. I have no clue what that reason might be, but I know that our God loves with an intensity and a depth that he wouldn't force you to go through something that's going to push you away from him. He's going to allow you to go through things that you are capable of withstanding. And that is the reality that we see here, that God can calm it at any moment. And if it gets too overwhelming for you, I think God would know before you would. And he would take care of you no matter what that's going to look like. Amen? Perhaps the true greatness of this calm that God can so easily manifest is that he can create a calm in us that transcends situation. That we don't need to be out of the tempest in order to be calm. We don't need to be out of the storm, the the hardship, the trial, for us to have peace in our God. That's how great our God is. That he can create that peace, create that calm in you and in me. Even amongst the storm. He doesn't have to quiet the wind and the waves. He just did it here so we know he could. He doesn't have to do that to create calm and peace in you. Amen? Amen. Everything that we can do to have even greater anything must come from our closeness with our even greater God. That we fight to have this closeness with him. That we dive into what he calls us to live out. And any greatness we can attain to or any great things we can do or fill our lives more with is only because we can have that relationship with him, because our God is greater. One thing I want to share before we move on, great calm isn't always a good thing. All too often in those times of great calm, we can get complacent. I don't need God anymore. I needed him when all the things were were difficult and were trying and were hard, but now that they've calmed down, I'm good. How often do we live this way? Even the greatest calm doesn't erase our need for our great God. God is even greater than the calm. 
right? As, as great as this calm is, God is greater than that. So in your calm times, who do you go to? Who do you go to in the calm? Now let's finish the story. Verse 40. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So how did the the disciples respond to this display of sheer greatness and power? They were terrified. And we're not going to look at them here, but I imagine they thought back to a couple Psalms, Psalm 89 and Psalm 93. I encourage you to read those on your own. They talk about God being the master of the elements, of the tempest, of the storm, right? It's easy, to be frank, to lose touch with a healthy awe of how truly incredibly powerful our God is. We get a little comfortable with a God who is this powerful. And there should be some confidence and some comfort in knowing we are his sheep, amen? But there should always be this healthy fear, this healthy awe at just how awesome our God is. This is the the song we sang. Our God is an awesome God. Do we believe that this morning? Heartland Church, we need to understand God is awesome in a way that should inspire and instill awe in each and every one of us. We should be terrified at how he responded to this storm, to this tempest, how great our God really is. Who is this? This God is so, so incredibly powerful. The sheer greatness of what he exerted here. And the single greatest thing that Jesus ever did, at least in my perspective, is going to the cross for you and me. The sheer greatness shown by Jesus being sent to that cross to suffer so much for us who didn't deserve it. And yet, as he humbled and submitted himself to death, even death on a cross, he came out the other side in victory. He didn't just let death win. He punched death in the face and said, this is my town now, right? Jesus owned death. He he was victorious over it. He won. This is how great our God truly is. The, The one thing man cannot ever hope to overcome on his own. And Jesus did it in one try. Took him a couple days, but he did it, right? That's incredible. That is awesome. And we need to be in awe of how great our God truly is. That is why we sing and we worship and we lift our hearts up to him. That is why he truly is worthy of that worship. This is why we can have ourselves deny ourselves, right? That we can set aside what we would like to do. This is what inspires us to do it. This is why we love why we serve. This is why we obey everything that Jesus has called us to do because God is that awesome that he deserves, that he is worthy of our reverence, of our utter respect and awe. So let's treat God with that reverence. Not just this morning, but let's really think about how am I reverent towards God with the way I live my life every single day? Am I in touch with how awesome my God is? Brothers and sisters, there are plenty of things in our lives that are great. Uh, Whether it's a great storm, a great calm, or anything in between. And the reality is, our God is even greater. Our God is truly greater than all of those things. So let's live in a way that reflects His greatness. To God be the glory. Thank you.